time once again for Community Forum. And we are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, George Lakey. George Lakey is a Quaker activist and expert in nonviolent activism. He is a co-founder of Earth Quaker Action Group, which just won its five-year campaign to force a major U.S. bank to give up financing mountaintop removal coal mining. He has led over 1,500 workshops on five continents. He has worked with Cesar Chavez in leading strategy workshops for activists, worked in the Burmese jungle teaching the theory of nonviolent struggle to pro-democracy students in a guerrilla encampment, and preceding the 1994 elections in South Africa, he co-led peacekeeping workshops with African National Congress members and others in the skills of nonviolent intervention. He is a columnist at Waging Nonviolence and the author of numerous books, including Afflicting the Comfortable, Afflicting the Comfortable, Strategy for a Living Revolution, and his latest book, Viking Economics, How the Scandinavians Got It Right and How We Can Too. George, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thanks for inviting me. So start out, uh, tell us, so when, how and when did you first become an activist? It really started when I was 12 years old and the elders in my church thought that I might have the makings of a child preacher. That was the experience of James Baldwin and some other folks. And they thought maybe I was that kind of person. So they gave me the pulpit. They said, okay, in a month's time, Sunday morning, you get to preach the sermon. It was a kind of audition. And so I prayed, 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 you know, what shall I speak on? And so that morning came and my sermon was that it was God's will that there should be racial equality. Well, this was 1949. This was a small town in rural Pennsylvania. No one in that church wanted to hear a sermon on racial equality. And that was the end of my preaching career. One day preaching career. <laughs> and it took a lot of, little while for me to even be able to contextualize that and realize, oh, that was a kind of activism, actually. <laughs> so was that with the Quaker church? No, and it was an evangelical uh, fundamentalist church, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Then how did Pretty you right-wing politics. How did you transition over to uh, Quakers? I found the Quakers when I was an undergrad. And there was not a church of my denomination in that town, so I did the rounds, check out, you know, what do Catholics do, what do Baptists do, and so on. And I ran into Quakers, and I thought, oh, this is it. Yeah. And when did you start focusing on nonviolence and pacifism? Well, my first, that was really an amazing encounter with Quakers because I loved the form of worship. And then on my way out, I saw on their bulletin board that we were supposed to write our congresspeople and urge against military draft. And so I saw that and my heart sank. And I thought, oh, that's right. I have heard that about Quakers, that they're pacifists. Oh, that's terrible. Because there was no, I was a very pro-military family I'd been brought up in. And there was no way I could, you know, I could imagine. And then on the way home, I kept thinking about it. I thought, well, even good people can have weird eccentricities. So I, in my magnanimity as a 19-year-old, would forgive Quakers for being so crazy as to be peaceniks. And uh, so I forgave them. <laughs> but, of course, by going back over and over and over, uh, it finally woke me up to maybe I should take a serious look at where that was coming from. And I took a serious look. I took a year actually doing research and so on into, you know, encounters with uh, evildoers, you know, people wanting to you in and that kind of thing. What What's your response? What makes sense? And ended up the year thinking, oh my gosh, I guess I'm a pacifist too. Okay. And then when did you start translating that into yourself taking action? That was, that translation was done in the, in the context of the civil rights movement. So it wasn't too long before I got arrested in a civil rights demonstration and that kind of thing. So, yeah, that was hugely formative for me. Dr. King and that whole business was going on. I was very, very inspired by the civil rights movement. So that linked up to my 12-year-old you know, perception that, that uh, racial equality is a, is a huge priority. Uh, and then, but that, that, there was a whole craft behind that. Because one of the things that enabled the civil rights movement to make such enormous strides, given that neither major political party wanted any anything to do with that, you know, it was a a, a, a kind of agreement, really, among the you know white 
Democrats and Republicans, that there would not be racial equality. And so, uh, especially in the Deep South, where the persecution was so great from the Ku Klux Klan and the state governments and the local governments, um, the the Civil Rights Movement was totally up against it and was nevertheless winning victories. And that deeply impressed me. And I thought, whoa, uh, you know, if, if you can make victories against odds like that, then we're talking about some a kind of technology that's enormously powerful. And how do we tap that for a variety of other causes as well? And that set me off really on a lifelong search for how do we get very practical when it looks hopeless, when it looks as though you know, the, the government's jammed up in some ways, totally stuck, and you can't make progress. Well, but wait a minute, did the civil rights movement you know, turn over and play dead? No, they took advantage of every opportunity they could get in order to forge change. All right. So, and then how did you make the transition to wanting to pass this knowledge on to others? Well, one of the things that they did was training. They did actually, uh, do, do, they relied especially on role play, that kind of thing. And fortunately in the Philadelphia area where, where I was based, the, one of the uh, people there had a lot of expertise in training. So I apprenticed myself to him, a guy named Charlie Walker, and I would go wherever he went and learned training from him and then, and, and then uh, you know, made more practice of my own and became the, uh, one of the trainers for the Mississippi summer in 1964 when uh, almost 1,000 northern folks went to Mississippi to do voter registration and face the Ku Klux Klan and so on. So I, I was part of that training team out in Ohio that trained people to go south, even, even though it, it was very inspiring to me that uh, so many young people were willing to go ahead to Mississippi, even though they knew they might not be coming back because it was just so such a deadly place to uh, to try to push a nonviolent uh, equal rights movement. Yeah. So the different organizations and causes that you uh, got involved with, was that all by your choosing or did some of them reach out to you for help, or how did that happen? All kinds of different ways. Like in one case, uh, the, the trees on our street started to be cut down, you know, out, out of the blue. And uh, I, I was coming home from work. I was working at that time at a school called the Martin Luther King School of Social Change, which <laughs> had students, uh, you know, from all over the country and other countries who wanted to develop more expertise. We gave an MA, I, uh, I, MA in social change. I called it a master's in agitation. <laughs> and I came home at the end of the day and uh, or toward the end of the day uh, one day and my uh, then wife, Barrett Lakey, was... Uh, met me at the door and said, quick, quick, do something. You're supposed to know what to do. Make them stop this. And uh, I said, but but with what leverage? You know, Because I didn't see anything, any resistance going on. And she said, oh, me and Pat next door, the woman next door, the mom next door, already agreed we would take our babies out and stand under the, under the, uh, <laughs> under the tree. <laughs> but we wanted somebody to tell the city that. And I said, you're going to take my baby out, <laughs> out and stand under the tree? <laughs> you're crazy. And they said, and, and she said, well, we're going to do it. So you better do something. So I sprang into action and found myself the leader of a, you know, of a neighborhood movement that stopped the cutting of trees and, uh, and forced them to, you know, uh, to do the right thing. So, uh, so sometimes, you know, it, it felt like the struggle chose me. And other times I could see that there was something coming up in, in the environmental field or economic justice issues when, when Ronald Reagan was, vote, uh, was elected president, then it was a very important time to push harder on economic justice because his job was to lead a counter offensive against the American people's mm -hmm. uh, victories you know, that we'd had in the 60s and 70s. Um, so sometimes it, it felt like it, you know, I was chosen or I could just see, Hey, it's time to put my, my, whatever talent I have to work, you know, in, in this particular way. Well, it would seem like right now at this point in history, in terms of the U S and, um, human civilization that your talents, uh, are sorely needed. <laughs> um, could you talk about, give a comparison of what we you believe we should be focusing on now and 
maybe you know compare it to some other time periods like i mean you just mentioned ronald reagan so mm. um seems there might be some parallels with that right i, I think there are um I, i'm very much for doing campaigns uh for that most appeal to people in different spots so the dreamers you know need campaign to be able to stay in this country and uh, Black Lives Matters folks need to campaign around police abuse and so on. And uh, the, th the cool thing about campaigns, we found this out actually in the nuclear power movement, the, mo the movement against nuclear power, uh, was that if you do a campaign that's heartfelt, that has to do with your interests, you know, that they're going to build this thing or, or they're doing this thing, it's wrong, uh, with a very specific target and a very specific demand, and then you win or you make considerable progress on that, that inspires other people to do like campaigns. And next thing you know, you have something called a movement, like we could call Black Lives Matters a movement, right? Because there are multiple campaigns in many cities all over the country. Uh, so once you've got a movement, then it's interesting to look around and see, oh, what are the other movements that are going on? Oh, well, there's a, a, also a, a climate crisis movement. Well, how about that? And, uh, and that, again, like there can be a lot of pipeline fights. And, and this, so there's a whole thing. So multiple campaigns create multiple movements. And then the, the, uh, the, the real art is sewing those movements together. So you get a movement of movements that's when you're talking about mass. And it's mass that we need in order to really tackle the, the fundamental power problems in this country. The fact that we don't have a democracy, the fact that our country is really run by the economic elite. And we, in order to counter that, we need to, uh, to, to reach the level of mass. And so uh, we can do that through a movement of movements, but, it, but each of those movements needs to have solid legs under it, and the legs under it are the specific campaigns, often local, that are going after local targets. Okay, once you get that movement of movements, of course, that's when the economic elite starts to sweat because they don't want to see masses of people. That's what we approached in the 60s and 70s, uh, uh, organized against them, with more and more people making connections. Oh, you, you're for racial equality? Funny thing, you're... Your opponent turns out to be the same as my opponent working on climate and their opponent over there working on immigration and LGBT opponent all, all turns out to be the same opponent. How interesting. Don't we have something in common here? And that's where the economic elite starts to sweat because then democracy might break out in the United States of America. And how scary would that be? So I, I think we're coming to a period where that's going to happen, that we're going to be able to create a movement of movements. Um, and I was talking with David McLanahan, new, new friend I've been making here in Seattle, and uh, he was reminding me that political scientists have now figured out by looking at many countries where there have been successful uh, movements, nonviolent direct action movements, uh, that uh, it only usually takes three and a half or four percent of the population to be active in a movement in order to win. So mass uh, doesn't mean 50 percent of the population or mass doesn't mean 20 percent of the population. Um, mass means a relatively small amount, but what appears to be a huge amount because most what, what the economic elite depends on is most people being a, a passive and despairing, you know, and hopeless. And, oh, well, can't fight City Hall, you know, you can't change the country. Um, but when that many people, which in our case might be, what, uh, you know, 9 million people, on, uh, something like that, uh, when you get 9 or 12 million people in, at, in motion in this country, you have a very good chance to make fundamental change. And that's what I'm interested in. <laughs> so do you have any insights into, um, for instance, getting different movements working together? It seems from my observations that inevitably people get very territorial and it won't cross that boundary towards working with someone else's movement and or someone else's campaign. Um, any insights on how to deal with that? Yeah. One thing is affirming very strongly you are doing the right thing in pursuing your, your issue instead of 
hey, my issue is more important than your issue, <laughs> which is very tempting to do, right? I mean, you know, over here, there are people giving their lives to their issue. It's very tempting for them to think it must be the most important or I wouldn't be willing to, you know, risk my life for that. Um, and so a lot of it is a question of uh, a, a lot of the sewing together of multiple movements has to do with affirming the validity of each of those movements and the importance of keeping them alive at the grassroots rather than creating a kind of national leadership cadre that is so gets so involved in infighting that they lose touch with their own base, which is happening on a, a largely on a local level. So that's one thing, a big affirmation, hey, your movement is really important and we're in solidarity with you and we want you to be in solidarity with us. Another thing is to in, invite people to be in active solidarity, not only to make statements of that kind, but actually to come to each other's defense. So, uh, you know, so look at, look at each other's eyeballs, right? And say, okay, when you're in maximum trouble, you know, when the National Guard is called out, to put down your folks, uh, we're going to be there the next day, just as soon as we can. Uh, and the, because those acts of solidarity really build support. So, for example, at Standing Rock, when Vietnam vets against the war show up in large numbers, right? That is a huge signal to everybody else in the country. Oh, what a difference that makes. I mean, what do Vietnam vets against the war have to do with a pipeline in North Dakota. Who cares about North Dakota, right? Why are people coming from the West Coast? Uh, well, because they see the connection. And so it's not, uh, I don't put a lot of stock in national leaders sewing all this together by themselves. It's much more that we assert that solidarity. We come through for each other and build trust in each other, that we understand that we actually have an opponent in common, the economic elite, and that that's what we have to move. And we can only do that together because, in fact, none of us is strong enough by ourselves to actually take care of it. You, I believe, in some of your writings have critiqued the effectiveness of demonstrations and or marches just for doing a demonstration or march. Is that, am I reading that that's right? That's right. That's right. One-off demonstrations, I believe, almost never do any good. <laughs> Occasionally, they're used quite strategically, but mostly they're expressions of opinion. And calling, uh, you know, the Women's March as an example, I th it was tremendous fun. I happened to be on my book tour in San Francisco when the Women's March happened the day after the inauguration. Of course, I went. I was curious to see who was there. It was fun to see all the newbies who were there, people who had never been before. That's great. That could be a threshold for them. So that has strategic value, right? But it doesn't, the reason why it doesn't have a lot of power with regard to our opponent is because our opponent knows perfectly well we're coming together that day and then we're going back home. And so all they have to do is wait it out. Well, they're used to waiting out all kinds of things. You know, they could say, well, in the 60s they gave us some trouble, but then they went back home. And so what we need to do is show our own sustainability. And we do that through campaigns. And that was the brilliance of the civil rights movement. Now, there were times, I was very influenced by Bayard Rustin, who was the most important strategist of the civil rights movement, and I sat at his feet every chance I got. He was actually a fellow Quaker, African-American, uh, key strategist with Dr. King and others. And he would occasionally use a national one-off march, like in Washington, as a way of getting young people for in, in that context, which is the late 50s, he was very concerned to get the historically black college student leadership to understand that there was a bigger thing going on. So there would be in the typical dorm of a historically black college. I graduated from a historically black college, even though I'm a white guy. I was the only white guy on campus. Uh, but I got the feel, you know, what it, what it, what it was like. Um, and so you'd have typically, and Bayard knew this very well because he was moving around all the time in those circles, you'd have a lot of people sitting up till 2 o'clock complaining about racial inequality, right? Complaining about white supremacy. Um, but complain, complain, complain. Does nothing, right? But people often felt too alone, you know, the, okay, there are the five or six of us, you know, we're, we're, uh, but what can we do, right? Uh, and therefore not, you know, not, not, move, not doing anything besides complaining. Well, complaining has never changed anything. So Byers' thought was, well, so we'll call this 
uh, a youth march for integration. And we'll say we're marching in Washington. And we'll make sure in the organizing of it that you're getting these hotheads from these college dorms up to Washington. And they will look around and they'll see 10,000 10, people like them marching. And they'll say, oh, my God, we are not alone. And then they go back. And you can see the payoff for that. Then February 1st, 1960, four guys from one of those dorms goes downtown, sits in. <laughs> they sit in and, and say, we want a cup of coffee. That's the beginning of the sit-in movement that, that swept the country. And, uh, and, and, you know, and that became the local campaigns. Okay, those four guys on February 1st in Greensboro... In 1960, they knew perfectly well they could not do a one-off and expect change. You don't show up at a lunch counter and say, I want coffee. They say, no, go away. You go away and that's doing it? No, that isn't doing it. You have to go back the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. Get more people, more people. Escalate, escalate, escalate. And then you can get that cup of coffee. The nature of a campaign as compared with the one-off is the sustainability and the escalatory dynamic that can happen. And that's what they did in Greensboro, which inspired the historically black college, you know, down the road in North Carolina, who, those students saying, wait a minute, if those students can do it, we can do it, right? So then they risk their lives to do it. And then the next, you know, three counties over, there's another historically black college and so on. And that was the pattern that was going on across the South that, uh, that woke up so many black people with white allies to the realization we even though the the democratic party and republicans are against us even though the fbi is constantly figuring out trying to figure out how to destroy us even though we have the ku klux klan trying to string us up we can nevertheless forge victories in that context so so yeah yeah so i i would say yes there can be advantages to the one-off uh, demonstration if you need to show something that the activists themselves need to learn. And the Women's March did that. Like the, the, just, just knowing that there were so many people, what, four million people or something like that, would come together in that moment, that was important to learn. But then that's it. No more one-offs are necessary. That's when then those people newly energized can go after campaigns sustain those campaigns, escalate those campaigns, win victories, realize it's not hopeless, stop complaining about Trump, and do shit that's going to, oh, sorry about the word, but anyway, and do stuff that's going to, um, going to actually make a difference. <laughs> One of the <laughs> things you point out in your writings uh, is recommending people to not be on the defensive, but to go on the offense. Can you touch on that? Oh, happy to, because I'm this old guy, remember? I remember uh, Reagan, right? So there we had been, 60s and 70s, pushing, 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 making victory after victory after victory. So obviously the economic elite gets very rattled. The, the quote, the, the natives are restless. <laughs> so we have to stop that. So Reagan's job was to stop that. So first thing practically that he does as president is when the air, tra air traffic controllers go on strike, he fires them and puts in jeopardy people who use airplanes. Uh, be, but he takes that risk in order to bust that union, in order to make the point. It was a much larger point than about uh, that, that particular strike. It was to send the signal to Americans, now we're going on the offensive. We, the economic elite, are going to take our country back and make sure and reassert control and not let you folks uh, you know, think that you can keep winning victories. So the stakes were very high for them, and they were willing to play that high-stakes game. Okay, what happened? The uh, U.S. popular movements, with, with one exception, went on the defensive. Labor went on the defensive. The women's movement that had been making enormous strides went on the defensive. The, um, the school reform movement went on the defensive. The elders who had been fighting for a better elder, court, elder care went on the defensive. A movement after the, the civil rights movement went on defensive. So a number of movements went on the defensive. In the, in, by, by that I mean 
for the, then for, to hold on to previously achieved gains. That's the, my definition of defensive. When you say, oh, we, we reached a high water mark, now our job is to defend that against the scurrilous right. right? That's the classic defensive posture. One movement uh, it was an exception to that. The other movements went on the defensive and lost, 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 and they've been losing ever since. Labor movement has lost enormously. Women's movement has lost enormously. School reform movement, I mean, they're, you know, public education in most states is being flushed down the toilet and so on. So, uh, so w w but why would we lose when we're on the defensive? Well, guess what? Generals will tell you, you can't win when you're on the defensive. Gandhi will tell you. Now, Gandhi didn't always agree with military generals, <laughs> but on strategy, he did. He said, you can't win anything on the defensive. You've got to go on the offensive to win. Uh, huh. Well, is there any folk wisdom on this subject? Hey, in audience after audience, I say, complete this sentence, please. The best defense is, and everybody in the room says, an offense. It's folk wisdom. So why is the Democratic Party right now, as I look into your eyes, why is the Democratic Party going on the defense? Violating base, strategy law number one, never go on the defensive. And that's what the Democrats not only are doing with, within the Democratic Party, they want the rest of us to do that as well. Even though that's exactly what they did in the 80s under Ronald Reagan and lost ground ever since. So... Uh, yeah, I feel very, very strongly about that. Now, the one movement that didn't do that, the one movement that stayed on the offensive was the LGBT movement. A, uh, the, the, uh, the ACT UP, amazing, in-your-face, nonviolent direct action movement that made gains after gains after gains after gains. Next thing you know, demanding a further, not just defending the previously held gains, but saying, we want marriage equality. Oh, my God. God, you know, the, 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 the trembling in the boots of the homophobes. And, you know, the, the exclamations, there's a homosexual agenda. Oh, my God. Well, of course there was a homosexual agenda <laughs> because these are visionary people. I was part of that. I was arrested in that cause. I'm, I'm a gay man. I was arrested in that cause uh, at the Supreme Court, the largest civil disobedience we ever did in the Supreme Court uh, over over this issue. On the, uh, on the offensive about equality in the military. How about that? Oh, no, not the military, our cherished institution. We want to retain heterosexual, you know, enforced heterosexuality in the military of all places. And uh, because there was no stopping LGBT. Well, what is the one movement in American life since 1980 that has made the main strides? And that's been the LGBT because they've been on the offensive. So please tell me, any of your listeners, please write to me and tell me why we should go on the defensive right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. We're talking with George Lakey. He is a uh, columnist at Waging Nonviolence, uh, website waging nonviolence waging nonviolence .org. Okay. Right. He's mm -hmm. also a keynote speaker at tonight's uh, PNHP Physicians for a National Health Program, Western Washington's annual meeting taking place at uh, 7 p.m. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. at Kane Hall at University of Washington, room 220. And, uh, and, but you're going to have a book signing actually even before that. I yeah, 5.30. I hope so people come by because I love this. This book, we have so much strategy to learn from the Nordics. They pulled off nonviolent revolutions, and they actually did push the economic elite out. And uh, everybody who wants to know how to push the economic elite out of dominance of a society can learn a lot from the Nordics, and that's what I focus on in the book. And you're also doing a training tomorrow, uh, Sunday, at... Um, Vashon Island. Yeah. yeah. Backbone, the Backbone, backbone campaign. campaign. <laughs> the, draw the blank. amazing kayak... <laughs> kayak <laughs> activists. <people. laughs> All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.